And so we put together an umbrella organization called the Global, Global Accountability Network that now has grown into four projects at four different schools. And, uh, and with that, I've probably said enough. Uh, our first executive director for GAN is sitting right here, Jeff Howell, who was also the first executive director for the Syrian Accountability Project. Our current executive director is Phoebe, who you all know Phoebe, and Phoebe is now the executive director of GAN. And so I'm going to turn it over to Phoebe, and she's going to say a few words, but, but turn it over to Phoebe is a former case graduate, by the way. I, I am. say how long ago, just a couple of years ago. Just a, just a little while, yeah, just a little just while. while. But, but Phoebe is taking on the phenomenal job as executive director, and of course you have students and executive directors beside her. So I said enough. Sure. All right. Um, I'll just start by saying, really by echoing what, what Paul Williams said earlier today, that um, the students make us sound smart. All of these students make us look really good. And the work they're doing is, is, is quite remarkable. Um, as Professor Johnson said, um, each of the projects mm -hmm. has, has produced uh, white papers. Um, fairly extensive white papers in remarkably short amounts of time, responsive to, responsive to crises around the world. Um, they've also been producing uh, crime-based matrices, which are then developed into most egregious incident and most responsible parties, which then allow us to develop sample indictments, uh, which you will be hearing more about shortly. Um, and um, I also feel that I, I need to say, I took this position over from Kate Power, who was, um, in between me and Jeff in, in Run Again. And so where I am now and what I have done is, is, is built on the remarkable foundation of Jeff and of Kate. And um, so what these students are doing is as much their, um, their work as anything that I've done in a couple of months. So I will start with Ali, who is heading up our uh, Ukraine accountability project at the university, at Suffolk University in Boston. Allie, please go ahead. Thank you, Phoebe. Hi, everyone. My name is Allie Lane, and I am the current executive director of the Ukraine Accountability Project. The UAP started in February of 2022 very quickly following the invasion, and we had an immediate response to form the Ukraine Task Force that was made up of teams from the other accountability projects. This past spring, we formalized into the Ukraine Accountability Project soft hosted out of my university, Suffolk University Law School in Boston, Massachusetts, with support from the University of Houston Law School. Since the UAP started, we have published multiple reports and white papers, including the considerations for setting up a special tribunal for the crime of aggression, and subsequently a proposal for that tribunal. We've also published white papers on a historical analysis of the appeasement as a modern threat to international peace and security, and a white paper on the ICC jurisdiction over extraordinary renditions from territory of states parties. This summer, we're very proud and pleased to announce that we have published our first volume on Russian mass destruction of the natural environment in Ukraine, specifically looking at individual responsibility. We've also published our third edition of our original white paper on Russian war crimes in Ukraine and the breach of international law. We continue to develop a very valuable relationship with the Ukrainian Bar Association, and we've established a position of UBA liaison to ensure that we are doing what we can to support them and make this relationship as fruitful as possible. This includes trainings happening on both ends. Not only have we helped them with providing trainings on setting up the special tribunal, but we have hosted webinars and trainings, and they are helping us to better understand the complexities of Ukrainian law and the conflict so we can produce the work that they want and deserve. Moving forward, we are looking to continue even more trainings with the UBA on both sides and training our, inc our current and incoming contributors on the GAN structure and creating our operations manual. We are looking to further our recruitment. This past week, we've actually already had over 30 first-year law students sign up to want to contribute to the UAP and we're looking to gain even more volunteers from the University of Houston and the UBA. UAP is just in its beginning stages, and while we have already tackled a great deal, we are continuing our efforts to pursue our mission to document, analyze, and investigate all crimes individually and objectively to ensure justice is served in Ukraine. And with that, I would like to turn it over to my colleague, Harper Fox, to talk about the Syrian Accountability Project. 
Thank you, Ali. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Harper Fox. I'm currently the Deputy Executive Director of the Global Accountability Network and the Chief of Intelligence for the Yemen Accountability Project. Um, I'm actually here today in a capacity representing the Syria Accountability Project as our current Executive Director, Aaron Ernst, uh, was not able to make it. He's from Syracuse University. Um, so I'll just provide an update based on what he sent us. Um, and all right, so last year, the Syria Accountability Project completed its investigations of the conflict year 2020, which includes its crime-based matrix and its narratives. Um, they've continued their collaboration with the University of Mich Michigan Law School. Um, and through that collaborative effort, they are going to publish a white paper coming up soon um, entitled The Dirty Little Wars, which is a comparison of the conflict in Ukraine with the conflict in Syria. Um, also, um, on this upcoming year, the Syria Accountability Project is going through a transitional phase. Um, the overarching organization will now be called the Global Accountability Projects at Syracuse University. Um, this change is to account for the ending phase of the Syria Accountability Project um, and the addition of accountability projects for other regions of the world. Um, and finally, the Syria Accountability Project will be working to publish a book based on the work of the Syrian Accountability Project, um, and it will involve the data that has been collected throughout the project's existence. Um, and I can just give you a brief overview of that book's content. Um, the first section will be an overview of the conflict, including the countries involved, both, pa both past and current. Um, a resume of the uh, current justice that has been um, attempted for Syria, um, the involvement of the United Nations, and a description of casualties and internally displaced persons within Syria. Uh, the second uh, section will be a trends analysis of the investigations findings for Syria, which will be an analysis of the types of crimes that have been committed, the time period in which they were committed, and the most responsible parties. Um, the third section will be dedicated exclusively to the most egregious incidents in the Syrian conflict. And the fourth and final section will be a um, call for justice and a reinforcement of the purpose of the Syrian Accountability Project to bring accountability for uh, the Syrians who have been affected. Um, and with that, I will pass it over to Jess Chapman, who is our uh, representative for Yemen. Hi everyone, um, I'm gonna to try to keep this as short and sweet as possible. My name is Jessica Chapman. I'm the executive director of the Yemen Accountability Project. Um, YAP was founded in 2018, so I've kind of um, inherited a well-oiled machine, so I can't take credit for all of the, the work in the foundation, kind of similar to how Phoebe was mentioning earlier. Um, but at the beginning of when I took over, uh, towards the end of this last semester, I oversaw the completion of um, last year's white paper, which examined the uh, effect of the conflict on children. Um, and then this year, I've actually, over the summer, Professor Johnson has been gracious enough to allow me to have approximately 12 interns this summer that I've overseen while I've been working. And so we've gotten to be um, pretty far ahead. I think we got a really solid jump start on our, our materials for the upcoming academic year, which I'm really excited about. One of those being the, um, the white paper that I'll be overseeing fully to its completion, which is going to be a white paper examining gender-based violence in Yemen. Um, and then. I think our, my last final update is um, in a couple weeks we're going to be hosting our first general body meeting um, and there we will continue recruiting incoming 1Ls, um, but the second part of that is going to be a presentation in uh, Q&A of my former classmate and friend Lassana Kane, who is a former child soldier from Liberia who was abducted um, at the age of 11 um, into troops that were loyal to Charles Taylor. So I'm really excited for that event coming up. Um, and start brainstorming some stuff for spring semester as well. Um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jeff. Well, good afternoon. Um, I'll, uh, I'll just start off by you know, congratulating everyone. Um, I mean, the student work that, that's been done here, I mean, we all stand on the shoulders of giants. I, I was the first executive director for SAP and GAN, but even uh, I built off of the efforts of the team in Sierra Leone, which did incredible groundbreaking work. And so we all, that's I think really the purpose of these dialogues is that we, we come to appreciate how far we've come and, and, and make plans for what we're doing next and how far we have left to go. So uh, I'm here to, today to wrap up our, um, our presentation on the Venezuela Accountability Project, um, which was founded as a joint effort between the Organization of American States, the National Endowment for Democracy, the Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights, and the University of Toronto School of Law. Um, 
Our project was a little different than some of the previous accountability projects in that it had early funding um, and we had the benefit of some pretty in-depth fact-finding missions that were already complete by the time we began our work in 2020. Um, and so we moved at a pace that was somewhat uncommon um, for uh, previous accountability projects and we were able to get uh, in about two years through the entire life cycle of an accountability project, which starts with the gathering of open source information, credible fact-finding missions, journalist outlets, um, social media sources, um, and consultation with all these sources to create our cornerstone documents, our chronological conflict narrative, our crime-based matrix, and then eventually our case dossiers. Um, and in the last uh, six months, I'm proud to announce that we finished really the final product of any case dossier in the accountability system, which is an annotated sample indictment. And in this case, we prepared it uh, for the International Criminal Court. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, sort of what, that, what that, in, that indictment has in it, because I think it showcases the potential of the work that all these great projects are doing, and that some of them have already done, and some of them are moving towards. Um, so um, with, these, with these sample indictments, we've previously developed, prior to putting together the indictment, the MRP dossier, which is our most responsible parties dossier, our most egregious incidents uh, dossier, which tracks the actual incidents, the criminal incidents from the matrix that form the, the backbone of the criminal case. And through an analysis of linkage evidence, we figure out, using the applicable theories of criminal liability, how to tie defendants to incidents. Once we get to that level, we use Charging instrument examples, like in, in this case, the case of prosecutor versus Saeed, where there's been some case law uh, evaluating the sufficiency of pleadings, which we didn't really have uh, prior to that, at least not to that depth in the ICC. And so using that as our sort of example and, and our notice pleading style that we inherited from the Charles Taylor indictment, um, we include all of the allegations necessary to make out the sufficient indictment. And then for each allegation, there's a footnote uh, that either says that the evidence is sufficient incites to authority, and it also provides a future prosecution team with uh, the location of that evidence or its, cust or its custodian. Um, in some cases, the FFM has it. In some cases, OAS or some NGOs have interviewed specific witnesses. So a prosecutor knows exactly where to go to start building the, the, the case file for, for that, to make it trial ready. Uh, for the allegations where they're insufficient, also we cite to authority, but we also, based on our investigative consultation with all of the open sources, we, we say, okay, look, we've, this is what we've checked and where we think this evidence might be or who might have this information based on the relationships that we've already developed with NGOs and CSOs on the ground. In some cases, the evidence is sufficient for either an arrest warrant or confirmation of charges, but we have some things we'd like to add to make it trial ready. Um, you know, additional cumulative evidence, corroboration or whatever, we make those same exact annotations right there in the indictment. Um, and then using those footnotes, we create what we call an Items of Investigative Priority Bulletin, or IIP Bulletin, and we circulate that to NGOs and CSOs on the ground as well as future prosecution teams. We have confidential arrangements to share information with these groups, but the main goal of these indictments is to help focus the international effort towards only the evidence that we require to advance the case. We try to uh, conserve limited resources and utilize partnerships on the ground to establish those, to, to establish those missing links uh, in the evidentiary chain. Um, and we've uh, completed that as of, uh, as of last week. We actually wrapped up the, the final version that we'll be transmitting once we figure out uh, the manner in which we'll be uh, securing that. And um, I guess with that, I will close and just say that uh, that, that, is, that is sort of the conclusion of VAP's initial case dossier. We have three additional case dossiers that target different um, courses of criminal conduct uh, that we were unable to go after in this particular phase because we had a sort of a limited mandate, limited funding, so we focused on one, the most heightened violence was in 2017, so we confined it to Plans of Mora in 2017 for this first round. Uh, we hope uh, to continue using this model through our students at the University of Toronto. Uh, and, and building out case dossiers for those additional incidents from La Salida in 2014 and also the operations for the People's Liberation in 2015. Um, and Plan Zamora as it's continued to be executed through 18 and 19. And our uh, wonderful students at the University of Toronto are continuing that work um, as we speak. Um, the only other uh, update I have, I have a few bullet points from Sam uh, Misner, who's our executive director at University of Toronto. Did that mic just come on? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I've been talking for the last few minutes. Does everybody know? <laughs> 
Um, so I have a couple bullet points that, that uh, VAP at UT wanted to share. Um, two white papers have actually been produced, um, and the first of those um, seeks to answer the question of whether the ongoing environmental destruction in Venezuela constitutes the proposed crime of ecocide, which we've also been working on separately. And I think this, this paper kind of demonstrates one of the real advantages of GAN, which is we all learn different approaches, we all research different legal grounds, but then we all collaborate bi-weekly and we share these things. And so what, what one team is doing with the Ukraine project can then be applied in, in, in improving the overall accountability system, which we at GAN are custodian of and continue to sort of improve and hand those lessons down. And I think this is a good example of that because the Echo Side paper was done elsewhere, but now we're applying that research to other conflicts where it's appropriate. Um, and the second was a uh, blog post answering the question of whether international law permits the granting of amnesties for human rights violations. Um, that's been proposed by uh, a few um, the pertinent nations to the Venezuela conflict. Um, and that the latter, the, um, the amnesty paper is available on our homepage, which is globalaccountabilitynetwork.org. Uh, it's recently been revamped. We've got an awesome new logo, um, and uh, everything really is uh, uh, a lot more user-friendly than our previous websites. So we're we're pleased to invite you all to take a look at that. And uh, with that, I will uh, I will close and just say thank you to everybody that has contributed to this awesome effort that continues at full speed. And uh, hope, I'm very excited for the future. So thank you.